Well, not so with that, he gied. Ah, Christ, I can see he did good yard. Am I here now? Brave young, cold blood, good achi. Irani, good achi. The guy, I'm cool. Are loyal soul. A fetcher he thought I thrust the wheel on against stars and dig with a man and previous gold card eve. Very warm welcome to you to this evening's research showcase. My name is Professor Damien Wolford Davis. I'm Deputy Vice Chancellor at Cardiff University, and you're here as part of a wider community. We're very keen to forge further links with and that community um, includes alumni, staff, donors, and a host of friends who are supporting the university. Some housekeeping, tonight's event uh, will be recorded and you will receive the link afterwards, uh, which you're of course welcome to share as ever with these research showcases. And just something personal, first of all, I greatly enjoy hosting these sessions that showcase the innovative research and real world interventions of Cardiff University. I often learn as much as everybody else does um, around the work going on in specific specialist units in this huge uh, institution. Tonight's focus is the Cardiff University Brain Research Imaging Center, Kubrick. It's a world leading unit. That phrase is often misused, but this is a world leading unit that, and I was reflecting on this, both, both like and unlike our brains, I guess, doesn't compartmentalize because the unit integrates expertise from various disciplines in brain imaging and in brain mapping so that we can understand more about the causes of both neurological and psychiatric conditions. I'm delighted to introduce our speakers this evening, and they are Professor Derek Jones, MBE, Director of Kubrick at Cardiff University, and Joshua Amatepo, PhD student here also at Cardiff University. And Derek is in Cardiff, and Josh is joining us from Accra in Ghana. Just before we start, I'll say a little more about uh, Kubrick, if I may, I'll be brief. It's a, a 44 million pound research facility. Many of you listening and watching will, will know where it's located. It's located on our main D Road Innovation Campus and it houses something pretty special. Experimental MRI scanners that enable us to see inside the microstructures of our bodies. And Derek will explain the astonishing views and perspectives he gets of those structures that both make and unfortunately all too cruelly unmake us so often. The aim of course being to intervene to address diseases and illnesses. <laughs> and needless to say, the st these state of the art technologies come at a cost and that cost is obviously financial, but also expertise wise in that they need really, really high, highly specialized knowledge to operate them day to day. So this evening, you'll be given an insight into the nature of the research. You'll also hear how Cardiff University uses our research facilities to develop affordable and sustainable technology that will help so many other people across the world. So we'll be talking, in a sense, about democratizing MRA scanning and wider uses of the research that happens on site. Following Derek and Joshua's talks, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers, and we've received a few in advance, and I'll start with those, but please ask the questions as they occur to you. Of course, listen exquisitely, if you like, to the uh, to the presentations, and then ask what you like in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer as many as time allows. But for now, I'm delighted to ask Derek, followed by Joshua, to present. Welcome a chroesoichichdai, Derek. Thank you very much. Uh, can everybody see the screen? I'm going to take that. I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, good evening, uh, Welcome a Croiso to the Cardiff University Brain Research Imaging Centre, or Kubrick. Derek, we can't hear you. Derek, just to say we can't. I'm intervening here just to say we can't quite hear you. We've lost audio on you, Derek. Okay, there you're back in the room. Okay, so we'll try that one more time. Beginners, uh, beginners, look. I was going to say with no expense spared, 
we have a drone circulating over us this evening. And if you look down about here, I'm still stood here waving. And we're going to go to this part of the building over here. And so I'm going to take you with me. And this gives me a chance to tell you a little bit about the imaging center and the facilities that we have in here. We were opened in 2016 by Her Majesty the Queen. And as Damien said, it was a 44 million pound imaging center. We're home to multiple imaging technologies, including magnetic encephalography or MEG, electroencephalography or EEG, uh, brain stimulation techniques, clinical laboratories, sleep laboratories, and five MRI scanners. Now we're just going past the three Tesla MRI scanner, but I'm gonna take you this evening to the seven Tesla MRI. So this is our biggest and most powerful magnet. It's about seven times stronger than the kind of magnet that you would find in a scrapyard to lift a uh, car. So incredibly powerful. And if I position you just about here, let's see, you should be able to see the scanner just behind me. There we go. So here at Kubrick, we're interested in a number of diseases, neurological, oncological, and psychiatric disorders. But we're also interested in developing new techniques that give us deeper insights into the structure of the brain. And rather than me tell you about it, I'm going to hand over to George Alagaya to tell you a little bit about the work that we've done. The world's most detailed scan of the brain's internal workings has been produced by scientists at Cardiff University. The MRI machine reveals the fibres which carry all the brain's thought processes. Doctors hope it will help increase understanding of a range of neurological disorders and could be used instead of invasive surgery. Our medical correspondent, Fergus Walsh, volunteered to be scanned. Here's his exclusive report. Now, we don't have the report for you, but I can show you Fergus's brain. And you can see we get exquisitely detailed representations of the white matter fibers, the wiring of the brain that carries information from one part of the brain to the other. This is an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented detailed image. Now, we're incredibly lucky here in Cardiff to have such state-of-the-art <laughs> imaging equipment. I think this study is literally about to finish the participants being taken out. But I now want to tell you a story about... Six months ago, I was talking with this guy, uh, Eric Borgstein. Eric is a pediatric neurosurgeon, and he took me to meet one of his patients. It was a baby called Emmy, and with her, her mother. And the first thing that struck me was the sheer desperation on the mother's face. And when I looked at the baby, I could see why. The baby had a huge growth over her face. Now, if you're of a squeamish disposition, I couldn't take a photograph of the baby Emmy herself, that would be inappropriate, but I've got something similar to share. So if you don't want to see this, please look away just for a second. You can clear, it's clearly distressing for the mother, debilitating for the child. I've now taken it off the screen if you want to look back. Now the surgeon said to me, if only I could scan this baby, I would be able to remove that growth and improve the quality of life. Now, I found this a bit confusing because just 10 minutes earlier, I'd posed for a photograph with a radiographer in front of one of the MRI scanners. So why couldn't Eric scan that baby? Well, there's two things I've not told you. First, this didn't happen in Cardiff. It happened 7,500 miles away in Malawi. And so this photograph is taken with Cole's Chilungulo, and the second thing I haven't told you is that this scanner hasn't worked for over 18 months. And this wasn't an isolated incident. We went to several countries in Africa and saw graveyards of broken medical imaging equipment. And this is because simply people don't know how to fix the scanners and can't afford the service contracts. But moreover, people can't afford to buy the scanners. Here's a statistic that in West Africa, there's one MRI unit for every 5 million people. That compares to about 40 per 5 million people in the UK. Now, I had the pleasure of being able to attend the African chapter meeting last week in Ghana, and everybody there said the same thing, huge untapped talent, but a lack of access to MRI equipment. 
Now, I'm the president of the World Society for Magnetic Resonance, and I've wrote, written about this, saying that we need to democratize MRI and help everyone everywhere in the world to benefit of, from advances in MRI technology. So what's the solution? I'm going to talk to you about two this evening. First, I'd like to introduce the hyperfine swoop. It doesn't look like an MRI scanner, but this is a modern piece of equipment. It's the world's first commercially available low portable and low field MRI scanner. It plugs into the wall socket and it's a hundredth of the cost of a traditional MRI scanner. It's a hundredth of the magnetic field strength. And that means the signal is considerably weaker. But what you can see here is the scanner being wheeled down the corridors of Kubrick this is the corridor that I've just come down, and you can see it's entirely portable. We couldn't afford a good looking model to lie into this, so you have to make do. Um, but you can see that we can scan in any environment. And indeed, it provides useful diagnostic images. This is a patient who's having a stroke. The area pointed to in green is the stroke, and the area with the blue arrows is bleeding within the brain. And with support of the Gates Foundation, these systems have been rolled out to Africa, um, sub-Saharan Africa, they're in this crate. This is one of the first recipients, our collaborators, Jess Ringshaw and Kirsty Donald in Cape Town. This is one of the very first babies being carried into the scanner by Jess, placed in whilst the baby's still sleeping. And you can see the kind of images that we get. Incredible for such a low cost technology. And in fact, if we try to um, estimate the volume of the gray matter from the hyperfine scanner against a much more expensive three Tesla scanner, you can see the data line up pretty well. So that's extremely promising. But beyond clinical diagnostics, we're also interested in repurposing this machine as a neuroscience tool. And this article from Kirsty Donald, who you saw in the previous picture, I think sums it up wonderfully. Working in Africa provides neuroscientists with opportunities that are not available in other continents. People in this region exhibit the greatest genetic diversity, but they face unique stresses to brain health, including child brain health and development. And this is due to high levels of traumatic brain injury and diseases endemic to the region. And most importantly, the neuroscience community in Africa has yet to reach its full potential. And this was realized by the Gates Foundation, who has put um, these scanners across sub-Saharan Africa. I'm going to mention just a few sites. So uh, Cape Town, Malawi, Uganda, and Ghana. Uh, these will feature this evening. And I'm delighted to say that Cardiff is one of the high income settings that is developing the technology, uh, developing something called diffusion and microstructural imaging. We're also funded by a program called Welcome Leap to see what are the determinants of brain growth in the first 1,000 days of life. And so this is the team that you just saw in Cape Town when we went to visit. And Cape Town has the unique possibility of being able to scan, not just on the hyperfine scanner in the middle, but also on one of the higher field scanners, such as the one behind me. So why we might want to scan across these two scanners I need to introduce my friend and colleague uh, from Ghana, Joshua Amatepi. Now, I was with Joshua last week at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. Here's a short video. Here we are in Ghana. Um, and next time you see this guy, he'll be actually live still here. I'll be back in Cardiff. Absolutely. So at this point, fingers crossed, we can hand over to Joshua. Are you there, Joshua? Uh, yes, Derek, I am here. Great. So Joshua, before we start, um, perhaps you could just tell everybody what you were doing before you came and did your PhD here in Cardiff. Well, before I did my PhD in Cardiff, I used to work as an engineer installing and repairing medical equipment in hospitals across the country here. Yes. Uh, I suppose based on that experience, I can be able to personally attest to the fact that there's this issue of be, being unable to repair medical equipment in the country. This graveyard, a lot of them go to waste because there is lack of expertise and uh, lack of opportunity to repair these things. So it's just very expensive to even repair or buy them, which has been a problem. Yeah, so Derek was speaking about why we took images on the hyperfine scanner 
and also on um, higher field scanners. So I'd like to uh, provide some insight on that. Um, people in the past have attempted to use uh, artificial intelligence to make a prediction on what an image that has been taken on a regular scanner would look like if it was taken on a higher field scanner or a scanner with a specialized hardware. This is something we call IQT or image quality transfer. And we've been hoping we can do same with the hyperfine scanner. So we want to be able to take images on the hyperfine scanner and then use artificial intelligence to be able to um, see what we can get from a higher field scanner if, those, if that image was taken on a higher field scanner or a scanner with better hardware. So earlier results of doing image quality transfer, we can see that there is an improvement in the anatomy that can be seen from the images. And this is a very good proof of concept. So if we look further, we can see Derek taking an image on the hyperfine scanner and then being wheeled in to take a similar image on the seven Tesla scanner in Kubrick. Yeah. So our collaborators at UCL were able to use both images to reconstruct an anatomical image. And if we look at the two images, we realize that it is actually very difficult to tell the differences between the image that was taken from the hyperfine and the image from the higher field scanner. So this is actually a very good proof of concept. It at least shows that the method works because the two images are indistinguishable. However, when we are dealing with uh, neuroscience, we are not just trying to look at all of the macrostructure in the brain. We want to look at the brain's microstructure. The brain is made up of multiple white matter fibers that form various connections in the brain and form different parts of the brain that perform different functions. And these parts are actually very difficult to see on a conventional MR image because they are actually very, very small, um, about 1 25th the width of a human hair. So in order to be able to view all of these things, we need to uh, apply some extra uh, methods. So um, the white matter fibers are actually a lot like this um, bundle of spaghetti. So they are just multiple fibers going along in a particular bundle. And assuming they were placed in water, we can be able to actually measure the movement of water molecules through it. So we can measure how water moves on the long axis as opposed to across. You will see that it's actually easier for water to move along the axis as opposed to uh, across all of the bundles or perpendicular to them. So we can take all of this information that we can get on an MRI scanner and represent it all like a rugby ball. And the rugby ball, uh, from this image of the rugby ball, we can be able to look at the main orientation or the main direction of flow, which shows the main orientation of all of the bundles. And we can also look at the, um, the order or uh, how wide or how elongated it is. Hence, we can take all of this information or all of these rugby balls in every single pixel of the brain, and then we can be able to connect them to form a map of all of the white matter fibers in the brain. We can be able to use them to look at the elongation and we can use it to also look at the orientation. The orientation is color coded. So when the image looks green, it means the white matter fibers are moving front and back. When it is red, it means they're moving left and right. And when it is blue, it's moving uh, up and down. So if we look at the image of the brain, uh, which we can see, we can actually be able to look at all of these rugby balls, take the main orientations, and then connect them all like a dotted pattern and be able to reproduce all of the white matter tracts moving through the brain. And this is called tractography. And based on this, we can look at the orientation of all of the white matter fibers and also look at the elongation, which can give us an idea of the fibers health. So, from this, we can see how the earlier 3D image that Derek showed was actually reconstructed. We can clearly see that um, we can have a very detailed view of all of the white matter fibers inside the brain and see how 
all of them are connected. So we wanted to see if we could do this on the hyperfine. What would it look like? Well, earlier results were not so encouraging. They didn't look too good. We could see some detail, but we could see that uh, the resolution wasn't so good. It didn't look so perfect. But after one year of uh, developing this technology with uh, my colleagues, James Golam and Alvaro Gomez, um, some significant improvements were shown. So we can clearly see that there is a significant improvement. We are actually able to see much finer detail of the white matter tracts and all of their directions are well color coded, which is actually very good. And based on this, we can perform tractography from these images. And over here, we can clearly see the orientation of the corpus callosum in the brain. And joining all of these orientations that like was stated before, we could perform a tractography. And here is a clear detailed picture of the corticospinal tracts inside, uh, inside the brain. Um, so what you're seeing here is a picture of uh, Gray's Anatomy. Gray's Anatomy is a classical textbook of anatomy that has been used by uh, medical students and medical professionals throughout the world. And this image is actually a real image of fibers from the brain that was taken by Derek um, many years ago. And we can actually see that we can get this same image from the hyperfine. And if we superimpose the images on each other, we can see that uh, they are actually the same, they are indistinguishable. So the fact that we can be able to get this same exact thing on a low field scanner is actually very, very good. However, in order to be able to take these kind of images, uh, it takes about an hour, but we can see that with image quality transfer, we can get good results. However, these kind of uh, scans take about an hour to do which is a very big problem if you're scanning babies, because we'd have to keep the baby asleep and still for an entire hour, and that isn't really feasible, and it is not good for clinical purposes and uh, research purposes. So my PhD so far has aimed to try to reduce this amount of scan time. Usually to be able to get the results we got earlier, we need multiple high resolution images to be able to create a very detailed color map of all of the fibers in the brain. And based on that, we are able to do uh, tractography. However, with the help of machine learning, we can actually take multiple or fewer low resolution images and use them to also recreate a color map of the fiber orientations in the brain. And based on this, we can do a tractography. And this actually reduces the amount of uh, time needed to scan the baby, and it makes it more practical for cases of neuroscience and um, clinical practice. And hopefully we can be able to uh, continue and improve upon this and get better results uh, in the future. This is mostly what I've been working on. Um, so over to you, Derek. Yeah, thank you very much, Joshua. Now you look very dapper this evening, so a quick costume change with a gift that I received in Ghana last week. So. You know, that's great that we're able to improve the quality on a scanner once we've got it. The problem is um, what we said before, there's a lack of local expertise to fix, or fix even that scanner, the Hyperfine scanner. The service contracts at the moment could be unaffordable. And again, the purchase price is unaffordable. And actually, since that scanner was launched, the cost has gone up and up and up. So we need to move to a different solution that makes MR far more affordable. And so to address this, we need to go from Ghana all the way across to Uganda. And I had the pleasure of going to Uganda. So here's a short video clip. <laughs> okay, so we're now in Mbarara and uh, we're just taking the flight from Entebbe and we're going to meet Jones Obongoluch uh, to see how they're developing low field MRI in this part of Africa. Indeed, we did get to meet Jones Abongaluch, and uh, you'll meet to get to meet Jones in just a second. Now, Jones had previously been working with Steve Schiff at Yale School of Medicine 
and Andrew Webb from Leiden University, who is the engineer behind a completely different design of MRI scanner. And so what this comprises is effectively tiny fridge magnets, which are colored red and blue for north and south. And as Jones demonstrated to us when we visited, they're placed into these um, plexiglass formers. And if you put enough of them together, you can produce a fairly uniform magnetic field. And so this is a picture of the complete product that we saw when we went to visit uh, Jones and the team in Imbarara. And it produces remarkably good images. This is data from the system in Leiden, but the quality of this from a series of fridge magnets is truly remarkable. Well, a bunch of us here um, in Cardiff and Umbarara, UCL, Case Western and Leiden, is a couple of latecomers to the party who missed the photo, have decided that we want to really democratize MRI and work with Jones and the team to really see what we can do to push this forward. Now, just to give you an idea, we think we can make an MRI scanner for a cost of about $70,000. And that puts it within the reach of so many people. So with generous support from Science Card that we've just received, our plan is to establish an Umbarara Magnet Building School uh, where people will come on site and learn how to assemble the magnets, then be provided with a crate with the constituent parts, and then be able to take those back to their institutions. And uh, we've identified some key sites to receive these. The first is Ibadan in Nigeria. The second is Cape Town in South Africa. And the third is Blantyre in Malawi. So it's great that's our intention to build these. But coming back to Coles and the image quality transfer that Joshua talked about before, um, we still need some regional centers, some regional centers where we can calibrate the lower field scanners of higher field scanners. And at the moment, this scanner isn't working. So our vision is that we can set up regional centers of excellence in West, East and South Africa. So that's the vision and that's what we hope to do. So I've spoken about democratizing MRI and explained the challenge. I think what we've provided is at least part of the solution. And at this stage, I'm going to close and uh, open up for questions. But before I do, I'd like to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Welcome, Welcome Leap and Science Card for funding this work. And now thank you so much for your attention and back to Damien for the questions. Well, I'm sure you'll agree. That's absolutely astonishing. I don't know what to say. Um, the it's that kind of research showcase that makes me so proud of uh, being here and um, it's unbelievable insight into how Cardiff is collaborating worldwide and how worldwide is collaborating with Cardiff. Mm -hmm. So engaging both. Um, so bring that, that graveyard of medical machines was absolutely shocking and humbling also some of those images and some of those experiences. Um, I love the spaghetti, the rugby balls and the fridge magnets, um, AKA tractography. Um, and I, I, I do love the T-shirts, Derek. That is nice. Yeah, not as good as Joshua's. <laughs> yeah, I'll have a word with him about that when he comes back. Okay, you do that. <laughs> Thank you so much, both. Okay, I'm opening the Q&A session now. Um, and if you haven't done so already, audience members, please know that your questions um, are, can now be submitted. Um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, two guests um, from Umbarara University, Uganda, who are joining Derek and Joshua on our panel. And you've heard of one of our guests already, Dr. Jones Abungaloch. Uh, he is Senior Lecturer in Biomedical Engineering and Jones heads up the Low Field MRI project there. And we're delighted also to welcome Ronald Armadoui, um, Biomedical Engineer and Research Assistant on that same project. So if I may, um, I will ask the first question. It's not mine, um, one of the ones submitted uh, previously. And I'll keep an eye on the, uh, on the time as well. We've got uh, a good slot of time. Lots there, um, folks, about AI. And um, that, that is interesting. I've got a two-pronged question, really. Um, how do you see it? This is very much in the news at the, at the moment. Um, some scaremongering about AI, obviously, as well. But how do you see that assisting in long-term clinical practice? Um, you, you've been talking about it in terms of imaging. And then uh, an adjunct question to that. Uh, how do you prevent errors? I mean, does AI ever get it wrong in that uh, shift from one image to an enhanced image? 
Yeah. So maybe, uh, Joshua, if you'd like to take the first part of the question and maybe I take the second part. Joshua, if you're still there, is your internet? Still here. Uh, the first part. Um, Put your camera on, Joshua. Uh, yes. Yeah. I was trying to hear the first part clearly. Um, it's about what What do you think, Joshua, about how AI might replace um, rather than merely assist in long term practice? Are you, are you concerned in any way about that? Well, I do not think AI would ultimately replace uh, medical practice. Uh, AI is mostly just learning. There's supervised learning and then there's unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, we just label data and then we let the model create a statistical representation of the data which can be used to make predictions of what the data might look like in the future. Yeah. And in unsupervised learning, we just give the data to the model and ask the model to group them. So this one looks different from this, that one looks different from that. But it isn't enough to make any form of um, medical diagnosis or to be able to make any informed uh, research information. That still requires an expert. So in the end, it is a tool that provides a statistical interpretation of data that's already fed into it. But um, as to what the information means ultimately, it's up to someone who is trained medically and professionally, someone who understands the context yeah. to be able to provide a proper interpretation of those results. And that's something that uh, a machine can never do. We still need the expert that's properly trained. Great, that's very clear. Uh, Derek? Yeah, in answer to the second part, um, creating errors, we call that hallucinating. Uh, so hallucinating anatomy is the, the actual technical phrase that's used. And yeah, it's an absolute challenge. And I think one of the real possibilities is that we train our models here in Cardiff to say, what does the average 21-year-old postdoctoral Welsh trainee or student look like and learn that relationship between the low field and the high field scanner? But what we really will need to do is to set up those regional training centers in Africa so that we can get you know, culture, social, economic, uh, appropriate models there. So I think that's the secret is to train locally. Great. Thank you both. So um, I'm going to launch into another question and um, please, Jones, Ronald, um, join in as well um, if you have a quick answer to it. I mean, there's a lack of trained MRI staff in the NHS. Am I right? Um, and also then a question, what about the level of training elsewhere in the world? Yeah. So just the first part, absolutely. Our vision is not just to provide these low field scanners for the NHS in this country. Our vision is to globalize MR. And so actually, Ronald is kindly standing in the MR construction room. So maybe you can see around if the Internet holds up. Um, but this is the kind of laboratory where we think we can bring people in and provide training. So, Jones, would you like to just elaborate about the current availability of training? Then maybe I can come back with the ISMRM perspective. But over to you, Jones. Sure, sure. Uh, so our lab has benefited a lot from uh, some of the collaborations that uh, Dr. Derek has talked about uh, in a few slides back. And uh, we have been able to develop uh, both the tools and the expertise to offer training, but also to build our own systems, as you can see Ronald is doing there. And we think that the best way to do is to train people locally in environments like this so that you can relate and replicate the experience in a similar environment in Malawi, in uh, uh, Ghana, in Nigeria, and, and, and things like that. So we think that local training is very good and comes gives also the expertise to finally maintain and repair these things when they are deployed in other center. Because like you have just said, when you ship a device from Europe, from uh, US, from Asia, the device comes what it comes without the expertise. So what we are trying to do is to develop both the device and the expertise that helps to maintain and keep it running. Thank you. And I, I mentioned I'm president of the International Society for Magnetic Resonance and Medicine, ISMRM. We've um, successfully applied to the Gates Foundation to secure funding to bring 
100 Africans to our annual meeting. So this year, people came to Toronto, next year to Singapore. But it also funds knowledge exchange fellowships. And we say knowledge exchange, it's just as important that we go to places like Uganda and see what the unique challenges are there, as it is that people like Jones come to Cardiff and learn about the high-end technology here. So that's going to be starting next couple of months. I chatted to Jones just last week in Ghana about initiating that. But I think that's the way this two-way flow of information is going to be key to a successful partnership. That's great. Thank you. Um, a question about the, a couple of questions really, about the agility of um, moving this technology out to where it's needed. So um, cost is one thing. Infrastructure is another question that's, that's come in here. Um, I'm interested in, in one emphasis in one of the questions around, you can see how this might be deployed really interestingly in sporting situations with that, the, that other major issue that's in the news at the moment, sporting um, injuries, you know, not least in, in rugby in Wales, of course. Um, but what are the challenges really of making it super agile and um, transferable? So, Ronald, I don't know if it's possible just to pan down a little bit on your scanner and we can see what's underneath in terms of the trolley. So it's um, I'm going to hand over to Jones to talk about the weight of this system, yep. and the requirements in terms of what it doesn't need that most MRI scanners do need. So over to you, Jones. OK, uh, so the smallest uh, MRI scanner that we have been able to see now and available in the market is about 700 kilos. This system that we have here is about 80 kilograms in weight. And uh, you can wheel it in the room. We don't need any extra shielding. So it is basically plug and play. It runs on ordinary electrical power. And uh, this is about 50 watts, 80 watts. This is the power that you would use on your flat iron, for instance, when you're ironing your clothes in your house. Uh, so this is really very agile, like you have said. Uh, we can load it in a car, take it to an environment, and immediately start scanning. So we don't need any much preparation to do that. So if there are any um, NFL uh, staff members listening to this call, please give us a call. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, who? Another question, a, a tech um, kind of a technical one, really, but an interesting one. Who produces? Who builds these? Now, clearly, we we saw building happening there in C two. Um, the the bigger machines, the the ones that cost millions and millions. Who are the big MRI manufacturers? Yeah, so there's four, three major players here: Siemens, who makes the systems behind us, General Electric, and Philips. There's also Toshiba has taken on um, making some of them as large manufacturers, United Systems in China. Um, but vendors like this, we're really trying to lobby, apply pressure to say, how about it? Just think of the transformative impact you would have if you were to just donate two, three, four of these scanners as regional centers. We were lucky to meet yesterday with the chief executive of GE, and we put the request to her directly um, and as always, she promised to look into it, um, but I'm hoping I can play this video back and say, you promised to look into it for us. That's amazing. <laughs> on, the, on the political side of things, have you ever, any of you, um, experienced some kind of barriers to what is clearly a necessary rolling out of this, a necessary democratisation? Has it been politically, you know, plain sailing or have there been barriers thrown up, quite apart from the financial cost? Um, Jones, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, yeah. Yes, if I may. Uh, one of the challenges is that uh, being countries that do not ideally make medical equipment, we do not have standards readily available to, 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 to gauge these devices upon. So we are struggling with developing standards upon which we should base our judgment when we are building these devices. And of course, uh, we wouldn't want to be judged against the standards of uh, QE, for instance, to have a QE mark or something like that, because these are some of the standards that might be very hard to achieve, but also might not be very applicable in our environment like we have here. So that is one challenge that we have. The other challenge, of course, is uh, 
uh, a sourcing of components which have to come uh, from, again, different uh, countries, Asia, US, Europe. So we are also still struggling with sourcing local components that would make the situation, uh, the construction a little faster and also less costly. So those are the major barriers that we have at the moment. So that's really clear. Thanks. Thanks, James. Um, we've got five minutes left and I do want to say something at the end, but two more questions very swiftly, if I may. Um, good question. The portable MRI um, units, are they, uh, are, do they, do they scan other body parts, folks? Or are we talking, we saw you going in with your head there, Derek. Might you go in with other parts, as it were? So the system, the hyperfine system, the first one that I mentioned, at the moment, it's only built for head imaging. But Jones, do you want to talk about, I mean, the possibility of scanning complete babies and uh, opportunities there? Sure. Uh, so at the moment, like you can see, our system also, it's built for the head, for the brain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, our first focus for this, we are looking at children who are suffering from hydrocephalus, for instance, that's our case studies. These children have heads which are bigger than their bodies. So if the head can go into the scanner, the old baby can go into the scanner. Right. So uh, looking at scanning babies, we are looking at scanning all babies, but adults probably will still remain at the head and maybe the limbs, but not the trunk. Something like that. That's that's clear. Thank you. And final question is a technical one, and it wouldn't um, have been appropriate for me not to ask a, a technical question, which I don't even understand, but you will. Are you planning to use novel T1 contrast agents to, to enhance images? I wish I knew what that meant. I can explain very quickly. It's something that you inject into the, into the, into the arm. It travels to the brain, and if let's say the barriers in the brain are compromised, that agent will deposit in the brain and be right on the image. Um, certainly, uh, the initial thought was that this low field, the enhancement wouldn't be so great. However, in Ghana last week, we were talking with Dr. Chip Truitt, who's a neuroradiologist, and he showed me, surprisingly, um, wonderful enhancement with uh, contrast. So this was gadolinium contrast, if the question was about novel contrast agents, um, of course, you know, the optimism, they would work too. But I can tell you that intravenous uh, gadolinium does provide enhancement. Great. Thank you very much. That has been an absolutely amazing three quarters of an hour. Thank you so much, Derek, Joshua, Jones and Ronald. Um, and I also want to thank our webinar audience for being with us. I hope you find it interesting. Humbling is the word again I um, I'd, I'd point to. And that's my own experience of uh, the last 45 minutes. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question, we will follow up with you directly. So we've, we've logged all questions. Mm -hmm. And as I said at the beginning, you'll receive an email next uh, few days with a copy of the recording and links to register for future events. And just a heads up on that score, our next one in the series, Pursuing mm -hmm. Net Zero with Alternative Fuels. That is taking place on, mark the date, Thursday, the 16th of November, slightly earlier time this time, 2 p.m. So that's Thursday, 16th of November, 2 p.m., pursuing net zero with alternative fuels. Again, something that we're uh, making headway with in Cardiff. Very much hope you'll be able to join us. And I need to hear myself saying, if anyone watching would like to get involved in precisely this kind of work at Cardiff University, volunteering time to help our students, help us fundraise, uh, for our research, and you've seen the impact there, please follow the link in the comments box um, that's been flashed up right now. So from me, and on behalf of our new Vice Chancellor, Professor Wendy Lana also, on behalf of the speakers this evening, Diochamari Aunichi, and Huilvaur, thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.